I'm glad to uh, find a literate, a literate faculty member. That's very good. You read very well, Neil. I really enjoyed that. I would also like to uh, invite all of you in the back to come on down and get some of these A and B seats that are left. Uh, we've even got one college president on the front row, so I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about that. Marvin, it's good to see you again. How are you? I went to college during the, uh, during the 50s. In fact, it was exactly 20 years ago this year that I graduated with a baccalaureate. And uh, thinking about uh, my graduation and how times have changed uh, brought to mind a story I would like to share with you because during the 50s, going to college was mostly fun. It was before the days of accountability. It was before the days of Howard Jarvis. It was before the days of NCHIMS, uh, Jana. Uh, taxpayers, revolts, data collection, so forth and so on. And mostly in college, uh, those of us who were students had two primary activities. One was the old social custom of dating. Some of you probably remember that. Some of you older folks remember dating when boys and girls would go out together and have fun. We did a lot of that in the 50s. And secondly, we played a lot of bridge. And the only skill I know for sure I developed in college was at the bridge table. I uh, put together 26 master points as an undergraduate and got through three and a half years, mostly of dating and playing bridge. When about Thanksgiving of my senior year, I was summoned to the dean's office. Now you see right away that tells you it was a long time ago because let's face it, today's deans don't have that kind of power. You see, today's dean would send a courier to see if the student and his attorney <laughs> might be willing to meet in some neutral spot and discuss whatever the difficulty might be. And my colleagues in the law school at Texas tell me that with the process and appeal rights and so forth, that a student today would be 34 years old before you'd ever have to see a dean, see? But in my day, deans had enormous power, and they wielded it unmercifully. So I made my way down to Dean Setzer's office. He was a little bulldog of a man, and sitting in his outer office was my bridge partner, Benny Creed. And Benny looked at me, and he said, what have we done now? We've been there before, you see. And I said, I don't know, Benny. The dean came out. He said, Roosh, you and Creed get in here. And we got in. He said, sit down. We sat down. He got behind his desk and opened a huge folder, and he said, you boys are shy. Now, Benny and I knew immediately that the dean was not describing personality characteristics. We'd been to see him lots of times, and shyness was never a term he had used in describing our behavior. <laughs> he went on to define shy as deficient, and allowed as how Benny and I had undertaken more hours for credit than we had earned quality points. You understand that situation? Well, I was moved uh, by that. And I said, Dean Setzer, and he said, what is it, Roosh? I said, what are the implications uh, of this situation? He said, they're damn severe, son. He said, somehow, if you and Benny can't make a B in this college some way next semester, you simply won't graduate. Well, Benny and I left with a fantastic educational challenge because no one in our company made Bs. In fact, Benny and I doubted that Bs were even possible in that particular college. <laughs> After checking the catalog, it said if you were good, you could make a B. So at least we knew theoretically it was possible. But we also decided that if you had to make a B, you needed to be very careful in your assessment of the requirements of the curriculum to make sure that you got into a course where a B was possible, especially given the lifestyle Benny and I had grown accustomed to. So we made out a list of criteria to be considered. I will share those with you in a few moments. And then we started through the curriculum. I remember very well the first department we came to was the Department of Accounting. And without hesitating, we moved very quickly right on past accounting. And we came to the Department of Anthropology, which we moved quickly past art, pretty soon into biology and business, chemistry, economics, finance, French, German, geology, and, you know, all the things. And we're halfway through the catalog, and Benny grabbed my hand. He said, you know, we're halfway through the catalog. We haven't looked at a single course. I said, don't worry, Benny. We turned right into journalism, from journalism to mathematics physics and physical education, the curriculum only had two pages left. When we came upon the Department of Religion, <laughs> just has a wonderful sound, doesn't it, religion? Well, I'd been to Sunday school uh, as a small boy and had always been impressed with religious teachings. I thought the notion of tis more blessed to give than receive was really a neat teaching. And the one that had particularly captured me as an undergraduate 
was, was the teaching of loving your neighbor as yourself. I had devoted much of my undergraduate experience <laughs> to that particular teaching. And I had this tremendous image, you see, of anyone who could profess religion. I figured the professor must be a warm, kind, loving, charitable, tolerant, unbelievably forgiving human being, see? So we decided to look at the course offerings. The first course was a course called Ethics, and not knowing exactly what ethics meant, Benny and I moved on to Course 102, which was a course called the Old Testament. And you know students don't like old content, so we moved to the third course, which was much more exciting. It was a course called <laughs> the New Testament, see? And that sounds new and recent and relevant. So Benny and I got out our list of things to be considered. And the first requirement we had for the course was we wanted an experienced professor. That was an absolute requirement. Two reasons for that. We didn't want somebody right out of graduate school trying to teach in one three-hour undergraduate course what they had spent 36 hours learning in a master's program somewhere. <laughs> But mostly, we wanted a professor who'd been at the college long enough that we might look at his past behavior and predict his future actions in the course. Well, the teacher for this course, the New Testament, was one Dr. Rudisell, and he had been at the college 52 consecutive years. <laughs> Benny and I checked that off. We thought that was pretty significant. 52 years was enough experience. <laughs> Secondly, we wanted a course where there was a very flexible policy of attendance. <laughs> Some of you don't understand that, I see. <laughs> Dr. Rudisell had only peripheral vision. He could see either, either side of him very well, but he could see nothing in front of him. And he stumbled over trees and so forth on campus, but he never called the roll. That was pretty flexible. So Benny and I checked that off. And the third requirement was we wanted some stability in the evaluation procedures of the class. We didn't want a lot of unpredictable, capricious behavior on the part of the teacher. Well, it turned out Dr. Rudisell, God love him, had given the same identical final examination question every semester for 52 consecutive years. See? And Benny and I agreed you couldn't get more stable than that. And the question had always been, discuss the travels of the Apostle Paul. Well, old Benny and I signed up for the course. We went to class, I don't know, three or four times, seems to me. And we, yeah, we sat on the front row and we smiled at Dr. Rudisell. We said amen at appropriate points in his sermon, which he called a lecture. Then Benny and I played bridge. In fact, my next memory of that class was during the college-wide bridge tourney that May. And we were playing for the college championship, which we had won a couple of times. And I was in the middle of this heart finesse when Benny, my partner, said to me, I just had a terrible thought. That was normally Benny's cue to me that I was finessing the wrong way. And uh, I said, what was it, Benny? He said, I just, I just can't remember. He said, who was this guy, Paul? <laughs> we were finessing the wrong way and went down to, and of course we didn't know who Paul was. Uh, some of the other students said Paul was an early missionary, traveled all over the Mediterranean area. And as far as we could pick up, he had only two primary activities. He built churches everywhere, and he wrote letters to everybody. And later on, uh, Leon, when I got into the university, I found that Paul published all of his letters. He had a tremendous vita of published, <laughs> published writings. We said, where can we find out about this guy? And uh, they said, well, you need to get a Bible. Uh, so you can do a little reading on where Paul traveled, and of course Benny and I didn't have a Bible, and uh, we said, where do you get one of those? And they directed us to the library. Well, Benny knew where the library was. <laughs> he had gone through freshman orientation, you see, and had picked up where the library was. Well, those of you who went to college during the 50s remember that librarians had one overriding goal during the 50s, keep kids away from books. And outside our library, there were Dobermans all around, you know, so that only the most serious student could make his way into the library. And then once you got into the library, now remember, you couldn't see books. All you could see were lead walls. And the way you got a book in a library was by filling out a call slip with the title, the author, and the call number, see? And the way you got that call number was by going to the card catalog and finding the number in the library, and then we'll go get the book for you. And see, that was good, because if students had access to the books, they might check some out or read them or something really bad, you know. Well, Benny and I were in the card catalog looking for this book, The Holy Bible. And we knew the author. Somebody told us it was a guy named James King. We'd already been over that. <laughs> so we knew, yeah, 
we knew uh, we had that down. Well, the librarian was a wonderful lady named Sally Bondurant, and she saw Benny and me there in the, in the lobby and wept openly. She, <laughs> she was about 100 years old, and she just she couldn't contain herself and was so pleased to see us, and was, she was reinforcing us a great deal. But, and we said, Mrs. Bondurant, we really need some help. We're trying to get this book, and you know, we've got an exam day after tomorrow. Well, bless her heart, you know, being a sharp, discerning, very talented lady. It only took her about 15 minutes to realize. We had the names reversed, and it was really a King James we were looking for. Well, Mrs. Bondurant put the call number down, got the book, brought it back. The book was all dusty, so forth. Benny and I looked at it. It had last been checked out in 1905 <laughs> by Dr. Rudisil. <laughs> Well, for a brief shining moment, Benny and I thought of A's. We thought of A's. We had a tremendous resource there at our disposal. And Dr. Rudisil had underlined, he'd written amen and so forth and appropriate points. And old Benny and I went back to, to the dorm, read all night. We read all of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. We were deep into Deuteronomy. <laughs> when the sun came up and not a single reference to this guy, Paul, nothing. <laughs> In fact, Paul was not begat anywhere in those chapters. <laughs> well, some of the students uh, told us we'd been reading the old stuff and that we should get into the new stuff, and so we, you know, we got the right chapters down. And then we went to the bookstore and bought a biblical gazetteer, showed every place old Paul traveled, what holiday in he stayed in, who the innkeeper was, what letters he wrote, the whole bit. Benny and I flipped for the gazetteer after we finally got out of school, and I lost, and I still got it, in fact, at the house. We stayed up. Uh, Stayed up all night, the night before the exam, and I know that's probably very unusual behavior for all of you. But when the sun came up the next morning, we were very confident because we could place Paul anywhere on the road from Rome to Macedonia at any point in his career. We went to class, took a seat. Dr. Russell walked in, greeted the class, went to the chalkboard, and wrote up these words. Criticize the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> I had never heard of the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> I tried praying, which seemed like an appropriate activity. Uh, it did not work, however, and being a pragmatist, I looked around to see if anybody around me was writing anything of value, <laughs> and they were not. So I wrote Dr. Ruthel in today's language, a warm humanistic feedback report, and I told him what a beautiful example of Christ-like behavior he was for all of us students. And, how someday I hoped I could be the kind of human being that I thought him to be and so forth. And for the love of me, I couldn't remember that particular sermon and guessed I would have to learn more about it later. Uh, I did learn a great deal more about it in summer school that summer. <laughs> but by this time, uh, most everybody in the class was gone. I suppose eight or nine minutes had elapsed and I turned around, most everybody was gone. And I turned my paper in, started up the aisle, and there was my buddy Benny. Only one left in the class writing furiously. Benny wrote for three hours. Got his paper back, made an A+. Plus. Dr. Rudisil wrote wonderful things all over his paper. said, Mr. Creed, it is obvious you possess deep theological insights into the teachings of our Lord. It is obvious you're being called into service. Well, of course, Benny had to build where he had some success, only A had ever made. So he went on to the, to the Lutheran Theological Seminary, and it's today a literal pillar in the Lutheran Church of North America. Well, I knew something was funny because, see, Benny didn't even finesse real good. <laughs> let alone possess any deep theological insights. So I said, Benny, could I, uh, could I see your paper? He said, of course. He, carried, he still carries, I saw him in New York about three years ago, he still had the same paper right there. <laughs> he pulled it out, only he had ever made. So he pulled it out and there it was, criticized the Sermon on the Mount, answer by Benjamin T. Creed, Jr. And Benny's paper read this way. Let those who will criticize the words of our Lord and Savior. As for me, I will discuss the travels of the Apostle Paul. <laughs> probably appropriate to say that Benny understood the real objectives of the course. 
I was uh, speaking to a group very similar to yours in Kentucky about three years ago. It was the statewide meeting of the community college uh, system faculty in Kentucky, and I was telling that story, and there was a lady on about the third row getting more and more agitated and more and more upset and the further I got into that story, and I figured she must be Billy Graham's grandmother or something, you know, uh, and I, or I was offending her sense of uh, religious propriety. Anyway, at the, end of the, at the end of the session, she made her way up on stage, and she finally came over and got right in front of me, and she said, Mr. Roosh, I am just very upset with you for telling that story. And I said, I really uh, hope you didn't take it too seriously. It was a little fun, and a lot of it's true, and I really didn't mean to offend your values. She said, it has nothing to do with it. She said, Benny Creed is my nephew. <laughs> she said, Benny was a wonderful student. I said, not the old Benny I know. It wasn't a wonderful student. It really is good to be with you, and uh, I suppose probably at no time uh, in recent history have we, have we in higher education, have we in uh, the community college uh, specter been faced with greater challenges uh, than we're likely to face uh, in the decade uh, ahead. Uh, I think uh, Leon's overview summarized very well some of the issues, uh, some of the lack of support, some of the greater expectations that all of us are going to be faced with. And it's going, to be, it's going to be a very trying and a very difficult decade for a lot of reasons. One is, and this may not happen in your state uh, as it may not happen in Texas, but we're going to lose from American public high schools between now and 1990 over 2 million high school graduates a year. And what that means is that colleges that have looked primarily to the recent high school graduate to populate freshman and sophomore classes are going to be in big trouble. Uh, the Carnegie Commission predicts that many, many four-year colleges, many liberal arts colleges, many private colleges will in fact go under during this decade. Uh, many public colleges uh, are, are merging. Many states are today looking at the merger of public institutions uh, as, as a way of dealing with the projected decline uh, of, enrolle of enrollees over the next 10 years. Perhaps even worse than that from my standpoint and an issue to which I would like to speak with you today is the sad reality that most of today's learners in American colleges and universities simply cannot read, write, speak, listen, study, or figure well enough to pursue any of the classes you are likely to teach next week. We're finding today uh, in a major project we're conducting for the National Institute on Education, we're in the third year of a five-year longitudinal study, that the average high school graduate in this country today leaves high school with a B or a B-plus average. That's the average, is a B or a B-plus. And yet that student is likely to be reading below the eighth grade reading level at the time of his graduation. I was talking this morning with Don coming in. I don't know if those data would be true in Utah or not because your state at least has the reputation out of the state of having an excellent public school system. But we're finding in state after state where we are conducting literacy studies that the average student in the community college setting on entry reads below the eighth grade reading level. In fact, we're also finding that the universities, the most selective universities in this country, I'm talking about the University of California at Berkeley, I'm talking about Stanford, Ohio State, the University of Texas at Austin. We began three weeks ago, our fall term, and we have enrolled so far this fall 7,000 students in our reading and study skills laboratory program. Most of those are students with B averages and SAT scores in excess of 1,100 who upon entry do not score well enough on our reading and writing placement test to begin freshman English 101. The University of California will offer next week 400 sections of bonehead English to the nation's most talented and gifted students. And Stanford University is planning to enroll 5,000 students next week in its Learning Assistance Center. 70% of those students are valedictorian, salutatorian graduates of the nation's finest prep schools. So when I talk today about a loss of literacy, uh, it's not a regional problem. It is not a problem that the high schools are today serving more students and more students are graduating today than was true 20 years ago. We know that's true. But we also know that the best students today from American public schools are not prepared to begin college level work. And I suspect that to some extent is a problem uh, you're dealing with and will have to deal with in this state, maybe next week and certainly for the rest of this decade. The challenge is for the colleges, how can you be an open door institution and yet maintain the quality 
that college level work should indicate and signify to all of your supporters. And I think the point that you made about keeping integrity and keeping quality is an absolute must. I'm convinced today that many colleges, in order to accommodate the learning needs of students who've been admitted, have in fact watered down college curricula so that students who read at the eighth and ninth grade reading level can in fact get through an associate degree. It's tragic because the student may be as illiterate with the associate degree as they were illiterate with a high school diploma. And I really want to urge you not to do that, not to do that for whatever motivation. Do not lower your standards. The problem we face is one of building a foundational program at the college level. And that's a controversial subject. For example, most legislators, and I'm sure it's true in your state, believe that colleges should not be in the business of remedial or developmental education. And I agree with that philosophically. I agree with it as a parent. I agree with it as an educator. But the sad reality is the public schools are not promoting and developing literacy, and we are in a bind of having to admit students who don't begin to have the academic preparation to begin our courses. And we're literally between a rock and a hard place. The fastest growing courses in American colleges this year, folks, are remedial English, followed by remedial reading, followed by remedial mathematics, followed by remedial study skills. In fact, this last June, I spent three days at Princeton, helping Princeton University design a developmental education program for its students. Can you believe that? What are colleges doing? Well, let me talk about some things in four areas, and I'm going to have to move quickly. But the first thing is colleges, and especially community colleges, need drastically to revise educational procedures and policies if we are really to assist the students who come to us. Let me mention several. First of all, it is imperative that community colleges, technical colleges, begin to assess student academic skills at the point of the student's enrollment into the institution. When I was deaning in community colleges 15, 18 years ago, you knew that the student's grade point average was the best single indicator predictor of his success at the college level. It is no longer indicative and or predictive of anything in an open door institution because I just told you they've got a B average and can't read. Uh, SAT scores, ACT scores are not indicative of high level literacy. More and more colleges are having to devote time in pre-admission and registration to at least assessing student reading readiness. Take the time to give the Nelson Denny reading test or something similar. Reading is absolutely the key in the academic uh, scene. If the student doesn't read well, they don't write well, they don't speak well, and most like, in, in more likelihood, they probably have deficient study skills and they're probably behind in quantitative subjects as well. The second thing that colleges are going to have to do besides committing to early assessment is to use those data obtained in that assessment to help students make appropriate educational decisions. It is important to keep students out of classes until they have demonstrated they have the prerequisite skills to be there. And I'm talking about tough, directive guidance and counseling to put students into developmental compensatory programs if you discover they are deficient in basic academic skills. I do not believe that students have the right to fail in college. I believe they have the right to succeed in college and that our job as professionals is to be deadly honest with them at the point of their enrollment about the reality of their situation as it applies to college level work. We have identified in the last two years more than 25 community colleges in this country that now have better than 85 and 90 percent student retention through the freshman year with high achievement. And the one thing they all have in common are sets of educational policies that help students keep from committing educational suicide. The third policy I want to mention to you, and I know this is one that's real, is that more and more community college students are working 30 hours plus a week. That's true nationally. It's true because the average student today is 29 years of age, and the projections are that average age in our institutions will continue to go up over the decade of the 80s. These students are parents. They're working. They have bread to buy and rent to pay. Working is not an option for them. It is an absolute requisite. And what we should do for those working students is to counsel them strongly on entry, not to bite off more than they can chew in our setting. Those students working 30 hours a week should be limited 
the first semester to no more than nine academic units of work. They simply can't carry 15 and 18 hours of academic work at the quality levels you should insist upon and work 30 hours a week somewhere off campus. Last year, nationwide, in American community colleges, 45% of all the final grades earned by students in our colleges were X grades and Q grades and IP grades and I grades and W grades and Ds and Fs. In other words, last year, half of all our clients failed to complete the courses for which they enrolled with a passing grade. And when you analyze those data, it's obvious that the students signed up for five classes in September by Thanksgiving realized she was behind in all five and began bailing out of two or three courses toward the end of the semester to concentrate time and energy to pass one or two. Well, we're much better advised to give students good advice, tough advice if we have to, early on to keep them from buying into more courses than they can possibly handle. We really are going to have to do a better job as students enroll in our colleges in finding out what their skills levels are and placing them in appropriate curricula based upon that discovery. Now, I'm not saying that assessment should be used to screen students out of curricula. That's not it at all. I know many colleges where students who come and say, I want to be a nurse, I want to pursue the AD nursing program, the college says you're accepted into nursing, and you're accepted as soon as you meet these prerequisites for the nursing program. That is, that assessment is not used to screen students out of preferred curricula. Rather, the student is accepted into the preferred curricula as soon as prerequisites are met. There's nothing new out of the ordinary about my recommendation. Colleges have insisted upon prerequisites since time immemorial. And literacy and quantitative literacy are absolute prerequisites in college. Policies and procedures, look at yours. Open door college should not mean open access to the curriculum unless you want high attrition and low achievement. The second area I want to speak about briefly has to do with curriculum. Sidney Drumheller, the great psychologist at Harvard, says that 90% of all the content learned by people in school at any level is gone forever within six months after the close of the course. It is not stored away in some imaginary computer data bank in the back of your head to be retrie retrieved as soon as somebody pushes the right button. Drumheller says that forgetting Choosing not to remember is as conscious an act as is remembering. And he says that 90% of all the content learned in school is gone forever because mostly what we teach in school has absolutely no application, utility, and or relevance or value in the life of the learner. And Drumheller's admonition to all of us who teach, and that's what I do, by the way, is to make very, very thoughtful decisions about the value of our content every time we walk into the classroom. And Drumheller says, if we as teachers aren't excited, enthused about curriculum as we begin to teach the hour, not only will all of our students know that, but we're likely to teach them something else. We're likely to teach them that we're wasting their time and that school is more of the same old learning things that have no value and application in life. I want to tell you one story, I think, to illustrate that point. Several years ago, I was called by a college, a large technical college uh, in the South, <coughs> by the math department, to come and explore with them a very high attrition rate. Their attrition in math had been in excess of 60% for two or three years. The president had motivated the faculty to explore the causes of that attrition by explaining to them that unless the student attrition were reduced, faculty's, uh, faculty numbers would be reduced also. And so the faculty were all motivated and they were very excited about why students were leaving. Uh, they had conducted their own dropout study, and they found that all the students who withdrew from the math courses did so for good reason. They got married, joined the Army, left the area, took a job. They were stopouts, they thought. You'll always find that with that kind of study. Tom Cottle, the chairman of psychiatry at Harvard, says that failing is unacceptable in this society. How many times in your life have you ever met somebody who said, I failed? Or how many times have you ever heard anybody say, it was really my fault, see? Failing is not an okay thing in our society. At this college, we went to the teachers of record in the math department and said, what was the student's final mark in this class when they quit coming? Guess what we found? 95% of all the students who attrited, that's my word for the year, attrited, were failing mathematics at the point of their departure. People who succeed in college rarely leave. 
The ones in academic trouble, for the most part, are those who leave us. Well, then we went to the math faculty and said, tell us about the curriculum offerings in mathematics. All the students in this college took the same Math 101, 102 sequence. The chairman reflected. He said, well, the first nine weeks in our math course, so we, we cover quadratics. Now, you remember quadratics, don't you? <laughs> you use it in your daily life, don't you? Huh? Quadratics has to do with your ability to discern the values of unknown quantities, should you ever want to do that. And I said, how many of your students uh, at the college are in curricula that can ever use, build upon, require quadratics? He thought for a moment, he said, every student going to calculus will need quadratics. I learned that was true because I took calculus in college and I used and applied quadratics there. What I could never figure out was what to do with calculus when I got through with it. <laughs> I said, how many students are going to calculus? He said, about 10, 12 percent. I said, how many other students can use quadratics? He thought a moment. He said, our hydraulics program requires quadratics. I later found out that was true. He had about 5 percent of his students in uh, quadratics. And I said, can you think of any other group of students who take your Math 101 class who can ever use one time, think about, apply quadratics? He said, I can't think of any. I said, you've got a problem. He said, what's that? I said, trying to motivate students to learn content when you yourself can think of no value for it. Of course, all of your students have to take. And the first response was, those SOBs. Now, that's a Texas term that means sweet old boy in Texas. I don't know what it means in your part of the country. <laughs> and the dean of technology said, our students have to take the math courses, but mostly the math faculty wipe out our students, and those that survive Math 101 don't learn math they need in our particular field, and we have to use lab and shop time to get our students proficient in the math applications they require over here. Now, my point is, it was a losing proposition for everybody. Students weren't doing well. The math faculty were unhappy because they had high attrition and low motivation, and all of the support areas, all of the major curriculum areas that relied on math to develop quantitative proficiencies were unhappy and feeling that the math faculty were not serving their students well. That afternoon, with all of the technology faculty present with the math faculty, we had more than 300 algebraic applications written on chalkboards in a two-hour period. Math that was essential, that was required, that was highly applicable immediately in all of those cognate fields. And the math faculty said, golly, boy, if we'd known all of this early, we could have maybe targeted some of the math applications. So you see what I'm saying? We need to be doing that kind of very careful curriculum planning and development in our kinds of colleges because next week, friends, the skills problem I talked about earlier is minor compared to the attitude problems that many of your students will bring with them because many of them have learned to hate to read, many of them do not like English, and many of them don't feel they're very good in mathematics. And one of the neatest things you can do is to have them see that those generic skills, verbal skills, study skills, quantitative skills, do in fact have application in our everyday life. Some of you are saying, well, we're in the humanities, we're in the social sciences. Drumheller's notion there is just as valid. He said that the task of all of us who teach is to teach content to students so that the student can see the value to the student. Malcolm Knowles, the father of uh, adult education in our society, says that for all of us teaching adults today, we've simply got to rid ourselves of the notion of student and imbue ourselves with the notion of learner. And Knowles defines a learner as an individual who learns content that's perceived to be of value and interest to the learner. And a student is an individual who learns content that's perceived to be of interest and value to the teacher. Are you with me? And no matter what mountain peak you want your students to climb this particular semester, you'd better find out something about them and their interest and try and build your courses around content of perceived value to them. One of the most exciting programs I've ever seen in a college setting was in a prison in Alabama where a retired elementary school principal took a voluntary group of prisoners, uh, third-term offenders, by the way, and built that program to more than 500 in a two-year period of time with average increases and in reading skills of three and four grade levels a year. And I said to her, how in the world can you accomplish that with this group of students? She said, I don't know anything about reading. I wouldn't know syntax from rhetoric. I've never had a course in it in my life. But I know if you can give students 
content of interest and value to them, they will read it, and in the process, they will discover that reading has meaning and value in their lives. The book she started with, with all those prisoners, was Eldridge Cleaver's Soul on Ice. And they read that book, and they reread that book. And in that book, you know, Cleaver ponders why it is that black and brown people go to jail in America and white people rarely do. And he ponders why it is that poor people in America go to jail and wealthy people rarely do. But mostly the book's about all of the emotion, all of the anger, the hostility, the sadness, the loneliness, the fear of a human being in jail. And those men read that book. They reread that book. She introduced them to the autobiography of Malcolm X, the writings of James Baldwin, Leroy Jones, and others. The average prisoner read 30 books a year in that program. And second-year students in her program were reading Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. You remember that book. It's about a dude during the French Revolution, Jean Valjean, and he robbed a 7-Eleven store. Remember that? <laughs> and they send him off to jail. He robs a bakery, and he's sent to the galleys, and he's wondering throughout the book about the highest obligation of a human being in this life. Is it to obey moral and civil laws of not stealing, or is it to take care and protect those near and dear to you? She got them to mountaintop experiences by being smart enough to realize if she could ever have them discover that reading had meaning and value in their lives, it would serve them well. Some of those prisoners read Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Many of them got into law books and psychology books. She turned them on to their own learning. I challenge you to have that as an overriding goal for your own teaching. I hope that for each of you in this room, that students leave your class in December or January more excited and more committed to their own growth and development than when they start with you next semester. The third area is instruction. Policies, procedures, seconds, curriculum, thirds, instruction. There's no method of teaching best suited for all students. I've seen community colleges over the last decade go off the deep end with the bits and pieces of teaching. I was at a college three weeks ago in Michigan. The dean called me into his office, showed me five locked file cabinets, and said, guess what I've got in there? They'd been through collective bargaining last year, and I figured he had confidential dossiers on all the faculty. He said, no. He said, we've got objectives. <laughs> he said, they're all behavioral objectives. They're all in performance and competency terms. I kept waiting. He said, we made them do it. So we insisted that they do it. He was waiting for a stroke. And I finally said, Dean, he said, yes. I said, what do you do with them? He said, what do you mean? I said, who looks at them? Who reviews them? Are you trade and technical faculty members looking to see that the communication skills called for in your English classes are reflective of the kinds of competencies in the verbal areas they wish in their trade and technical programs? Are advisory committees in your trade and technical programs reviewing those objectives to see that the competencies called for are the ones they want and initial employees? Who's looking to see if the test items being written by the teachers reflect in any way the competencies called for in the objectives? He said, boy, we hadn't thought about all that. And you see, my point is, writing an objective is only step 1A in ever thinking about designing anything. And many, many colleges went down the path, if we can just somehow all write objectives, we'll do wonderful and great things. And I'm not opposed to writing objectives. I think it's neat to know what it is you're trying to accomplish. But I've seen colleges go off the deep end with mediated teaching, and I've seen them go off the deep end with cognitive mapping. The idea is if we can just map everybody's cognitive, boy, we'll do some wonderful, <laughs> wonderful work this semester. You see, the truth is, in teaching, you've got to be doing everything right to be dramatically successful with the kinds of students we have in community colleges. And I want to tell you a story that illustrates that point. In 1973, we were funded at the University of Texas by the National Science Foundation to put on a workshop for 100 community college science teachers, teaching them how to, in those, time, in those days we used individualized, systematized instruction. I'm sure today we'd use the words personalized or humanized. We keep playing around with jargon to find something that might connote goodness to, uh, to uh, people in the field. We brought all of these uh, teachers to Austin. We taught them how to write objectives. We introduced them to computer-assisted instruction. 
We introduced them to audio tutorial, to modules, packages, and the like, and so forth. The chemistry faculty from one large college in our state came to the workshop. They repented of past sins in teaching, were baptized and converted to our new technology. And we were delighted. They went back to the college, and they completely revitalized freshman chemistry. In fact, they built a chemistry program at the college that was keyed to performance objectives, and it featured as a learning style computer-assisted instruction. It also had audio tutorial, packaged instruction, and retained traditional lab and lectures. Fred Keller, the father of PSI, flew in from Arizona and pronounced it holy. He said it's just fantastic. They got grants from the National Science Foundation and the like. Wonderful things were happening. Two years ago, this fall, the dean of that college called me, a salty old Texan, and he said, John, six syllables, see, John. He said, you know how we sent the chemistry faculty up there about five years ago to learn how to teach better from you? I said, you sure did, dean. What a great group of men they were, and what a great group of faculty. I know you're pleased. I was reinforcing him, by the way. Deans need a lot of reinforcement. Do that to your deans. They don't get much. He said, John. You know how this faculty came back here and bled me in this college out of a third of a million dollars in hardware and technology to implement all those ideas? And I explained to him that's what administration was for, was to find resources to support teaching, and he, in fact, had done a great job. He said, thank you. He said, there's only one problem, John. I said, what's that, Dean? He said, it don't work. <laughs> that college for 10 years had been looking at student attrition by division, by department, by course, by instructor. And the attrition rate in Chemistry 101 at the college had been 50% for a long time. And it was that high attrition that had motivated the dean to send the chemistry faculty to our workshop to start with. And since coming back and installing all of this highfalutin technology, the attrition rate had not been reduced at all. He said, maybe we're not doing something right. Would you come down and take a look at it? And I was motivated to do that. I knew he would tell everybody that it didn't work, and it would affect book sales and all kinds of things, you know. <laughs> so I went down, spent a day with the chemistry faculty. They didn't know what was wrong. And best of all, they were really concerned that students weren't doing better in their classes. Now, that's a good sign. When you have, when you have faculty members concerned about students' performance, you're in good shape. When faculty aren't concerned, about student performance, you're in trouble. Well, at the end of the day, I was more perplexed than ever. I'd never seen a better chemistry program in my life. I'd never seen a more exciting curriculum. I'd never seen instruction designed any better. And at the end of the day, I was completely mystified. I stayed over the next morning for the beginning of school. They had a teaching auditorium a little larger than this room. They must have had 400 students in it. They all came in. The chairperson came out and greeted the students told a few anecdotes about chemistry, and then the lights dimmed, and they cut on a three-screen, multimedia, multi-sensory extravaganza entitled You and the World of Chemistry. And it was fantastic. The music was from Patton, the movie Patton. Boy, I mean to tell you. And it was about body chemistry and how body chemistry affects the thought process and how your feeling affects your behavior and what you can do with nutrition and good exercise and taking care of yourself to prolong your life and to be better functioning. Everything was of immediate interest to those students. The lights came back on, the chairman came up, kind of a relaxed atmosphere in the room, and he said, well, folks, I guess there's only one other thing I need to say to you today. And that is, many of you people will not do well in chemistry. <laughs> and he continued, he said, chemistry is an unbelievably cognitive, highly intellectual subject requiring academic skills, the likes of which, frankly, most of you do not possess. <laughs> And he went on to say that in his 10 years at the college, no more than half the students could pass chemistry, and he advised them to take English or history, something with no cognitive base. <laughs> I think it took 30 seconds. I wasn't expecting it, but I think it took 30 seconds for him to say that. And in 30 seconds, friends, he obliterated, destroyed, obviated, negated, offset five years of first-rate work in curriculum design and instructional methodology. You see, there wasn't anything wrong with the curriculum. There wasn't anything wrong with the instruction. What was wrong was a faculty member standing in front of learners saying, we've decided to machine gun half you people. 
in teaching, you've got to be doing everything right. And the tragedy is you don't have to say that to communicate it to a group of students because you communicate those expectations by everything you do in the classroom. Happy ending to the story. Last year, they no longer said to the students, you will die in here. And the retention rate last fall semester in chemistry 101 at the college exceeded 95% with high achievement. There was nothing wrong with those faculty. I said at the end of the day, why would you say that, George, to your students? Guess what he said? to motivate them. So that all of us remembered that we worked best when we were challenged and told it was going to be difficult and so forth and we've always done that to get serious, st get students serious about their learning. You see that the tragedy is for all those students in his class who had four years of science in high school, four years of mathematics in high school and SAT scores of 1400 above, he probably indeed facilitated better behavior. But what he really did was convince half of them they couldn't make it in the class and they left. That leads me into the fourth area, which is really the human area. Because teaching, teaching is uniquely a human profession. Teaching is uniquely a human profession. Rousseau wrote two centuries ago, in order to teach French to Johnny, it is imperative that the teacher first know Johnny. When I began my freshman work, 20 years ago, 24 years ago, I walked into a world civilization class as a freshman and had an instructor greet me by name as I walked into his door. And I was immediately bothered because I figured my high school reputation had preceded me to college. <laughs> but it turned out Lewis Brown, the instructor who still teaches, knew everybody's name as we walked into his classroom. He knew everybody's name in all of his classes. And it was obvious to all of us that he had taken the time to find out who we were, to review our records, to go over our recommendations. He knew something about us personally. Lewis Brown was not the most exciting teacher I ever had. In fact, he was one of the dullest because he read to us badly from the textbook. But Lewis Brown was the kind of teacher who called me the day the little textile mill closed where I was working and said I could sure use some help on the weekends. I've got some part-time work here, I could sure use some help. Lewis Brown so loved and so cared for his students that most of us forgave his lousy teaching and many of us majored in history. It's really important next week when classes begin for you to welcome, <laughs> honestly and genuinely, students into your classroom and into your labs and into your shops. Take the time, day one, to learn their names. If you teach no content next week, day one, so be it. Learn the names of the students who will be with you this semester. Find out about them. Have them introduce themselves. Use name tags. Let them introduce one another. But commit yourself to learning the names of the students who will be with you. It will be one of the most powerful things you've ever done as a teacher if you will do that. People in your class know whether you know them or not. Now you see what I'm talking about is not so unusual. We've always learned the names of certain students. In fact, last summer I had a course on college teaching, which I teach every summer. I walked into my class and here on the front row was this gorgeous, blonde-haired, green-eyed woman. And I, as I walked in, she said, Dr. Roosh, and I said, yes. You know, <laughs> she said, uh, I have waited for three years to be in this class. She said, I, I came here for you from a community college in New York State, and she was majoring in the humanities, and she said, I read some of your books, I've implemented many of your ideas, and I just can't tell you how excited I am about being here. And she opened her briefcase and pulled out four or five of Roosh's books, and she said, would you autograph my book? I said, you bet, what's your name, see? And I learned her name right away. She was an A student, and of course, Now you see, all of you are sitting there thinking, what a sexist comment. You're zeroing in on the blonde hair and the green eyes. Now let me tell you what she was doing. She was on the front row. Did you notice this morning that the back row filled up first? Did you notice that all the aisle seats in this auditorium are occupied? Just as your classroom will be so occupied come Monday, 
Your students will sit as far away from you come Monday as they possibly can because they are not evidencing a lot of commitment to their success in your classroom. And many of them are needing as much distance between you and them because they aren't really sure they'll come back the second day. In fact, some may leave on Monday. She was sitting on the front row. She knew me by name. And she said, I've already read all of your books, friend. I've already implemented most of what you know. And you see, she'd already done most of the work required for that particular course. Now, we as teachers love students who behave that way, don't we? They make us feel so good about ourselves. And we tend to give them all the attention. We tend to spend a lot of time with them. Learn the names of all the students who sit far away from you on Monday. Go to the back of the room and teach from back there if that will help. Sam Postlewaite says, Postlewaite's a great botanist at Purdue, that simply by shaking hands with students as they walk into the class, they reduce the space between where they normally sit and him. That is, the front seats are more likely to be filled up with students if you take the time to greet them. Now, some people are huggers. You know, they like to hug everybody. Now, you have to be sure that the huggy wishes to be hugged before you engage in that kind of activity. But shaking hands in our society is okay. Nobody's going to think you're funny if you shake hands with people. And you'll find that if you welcome them, honestly into your classroom and take the time to learn who they are. You're going to get better behavior. You're going to get better involvement with your students right from the very beginning. The second thing you should do come Monday is place great priority on student attendance in your class. Never say to a group of students in our kinds of colleges, I don't care whether you come to class or not, or I don't call the roll here. If you don't value their attendance, why in the world should they? Most of the great teachers I know say things like, it's imperative that you be here every time, on time. Class begins at 9, not at 9.05. And if you miss a, a class of, of mine, you owe me an hour. You see, you've got to expect a great deal from human beings, or you will never achieve it. And you need to help students learn early on to make a commitment to be responsible in your class. It also means that you need to be there on time, and you need to begin on time. One other thing I want to share with you in the human domain. If you will commit yourself this fall to picking up a telephone and calling any student who misses your class that day, it won't take you a lot of time, but call them and say, we missed you today. Here's your assignment for the next class period. And I would like to see you in my office at 15 minutes before the next class period to review today's assignment. Two things are accomplished. One. You're coming across as a human being who honestly is concerned about the learning of, a, of one of your students. But two, you're retasking. You're retasking that student. You're getting that student recommitted to coming back. Colleges, colleges with which we've worked, who've implemented that very simple little strategy, have increased retention from 50 percent to 75 and 80 percent within a year. It's powerful. I have a hard time not liking people who like me. I have a very difficult time liking people who do not. And when I think about the teachers in my life who influenced me greatly in this profession, it was those teachers who took a personal interest in John Roosh. They knew my name. They challenged me. They motivated me. They let me know that I was somebody important. And I suspect that is true with every one of you in this room. You really have the power to make a difference and to help students develop the kind of motivation and the kind of responsibility to excel in your classroom. I started teaching public school when I was 20 years old, in the middle of the school year. I graduated in December, took a job in a little rural school in North Carolina. I bought three Van Heusen shirts, pinstripe shirts, button-down collars for $10. That's why I remember it so well. And you got your initials monogrammed on your shirt pocket. And my initials are J-E-R. I walked into class that morning, took my jacket off, and this huge country boy walked over and he says, Say, hey, buddy, looks like somebody left the K off your pocket there. <laughs> that was the high point for the day. I had a student in my 9 o'clock World Civilization class who totally destroyed, obliterated my 9 o'clock class. His name was Kenny Ratsbottom. That was his name, R-A-T-S-B-O-T-T-O-M. And Kenny sat in the middle seat, the second row, 
and he totally destroyed the nine o'clock class. He was a little kid, about five feet tall, very, very small. He would get down out of the desk and creepy crawl around the room, knocking those huge world civilization texts off on that old wooden floor. And then he would pull the hair of the little girls and they were screaming. And he would hit the little boys on the arm and run around the room. And I spent the entire hour retrieving Kenny and putting him back in his seat and telling him to behave. And then Kenny would tell me what I could do, which was never very exciting, by the way. <laughs> well, at the end of the hour, I had barely scratched the subject. I had only learned the names of maybe five or six other students whose names I heard and picked up during, the, you know, during all the misbehavior of Kenny. So I walked across the hall to the department chair's office. He was also the head football coach, Coach Jones. I said, Coach, I've got a tremendous problem in my 9 o'clock class. I think I need a little advice and counsel. He said, Roosh, do you have rat's bottom? I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, I'll be darned. How about that? He said, well, let me give you some advice. Well, that's why I went. So he was to get advice. He said, don't take it personal. <laughs> he said, he's that way with everybody. He said, he's been a bad kid all of his life. He said, he must be, it's nothing against you personally. He said, he's been that way. He said, the whole family's no good. He said, they're all on welfare. He said, the whole family's just a bunch of ne'er-do-wells. And I said, well, coach, what do you do about it? See, I went to find out what to do. He said, well, I'll tell you what I do. He reached down, pulled out his bottom drawer, and a huge tetherball pattern. He says, I whoop him is what I do. And I said, well, does it help? He said, it don't help Kenny, but I feel so much better. He said, well, true that. Well, I went back to my class, see, with not much more insight than when I left. Kenny wasn't in the 10 o'clock class, but I was feeling so badly at 10 o'clock that I didn't do a real neat job of teaching either. I was thinking about Kenny Ratsbottom and not thinking about this group of students where he wasn't present. Well, by the end of the 10 o'clock class, I'm saying, golly, I can't let one student wipe me out. I've got to get some enthusiasm back. and I've got to be a little more dynamic in my teaching. And guess who walked in at 11? Kenny came in 11, had ninth grade English, destroyed the class. He jumped out the window three times during the class hour and locked himself in a school bus. The principal came down twice, called me out in the hall and said, you're going to have to get control of this situation. Don't you know nothing about discipline? I didn't know anything about discipline. At noon, I went to the principal's office, pulled out the cumulative record folder on Brother Kenny Ratsbottom. Kenny had never passed a course in his life. He had been socially promoted all the way through public school. By the way, 40% of all people in our society are so promoted through the public schools. He had never done well on any test. Uh, every teacher who ever taught Kenny had in the space available written awful and horrible and terrible things about him. His first grade teacher had written on his form, beware of this child. <laughs> and underneath she wrote, he's illegitimate. This, this was Bible Belt, North Carolina. Billy Graham really lived right down the road at Montreat, and I thought how sad that any adult could do that to a little five-year-old boy, uh, label him as a bastard for the rest of his life, and yet in that very moment I realized that teacher had a gift of prophecy because Kenny was the worst kid I had ever seen in my life. Well, at the end of the noon hour, I walked back to my classroom. I had as much cognitive information about Kenny Ratsbottom as any human being can know about a student. I knew the name of his stepfather, I knew the name of his mother, I knew where they worked, I knew the names of all siblings, I knew every test he'd ever taken, every course he'd ever taken, but I did not know what to do about Kenny Ratzbottom. I had Kenny that afternoon in my two o'clock American history class. And I remember that afternoon getting into my automobile thinking, Roosh, what in the world are you doing here? It had been, without doubt, the worst day in my life. I did not look forward to Tuesday. And on Friday of my second week, I resigned from public school teaching. Teaching was no fun. One student was absolutely ruining every day of my existence. And I didn't know what to do about it, folks. Well, by the third week, I'm borrowing the coach's tetherball paddle, and I'm, I'm applying the paddle to Kenny like everybody else. And the coach was right, didn't change Kenny's behavior at all, but I felt a lot better, okay? Two weeks later, I'm at the chalkboard writing something on the board, and Kenny Ratzbottom stood up in his desk, picked up a huge piece of chalk, reared back, and threw it just as I turned from the chalkboard, and the chalk hit me right across the brow of my eye. And it was in that precise moment of pain and anger that I decided what to do with Kenny. I decided to kill him right then. <laughs> and 
And I mean to tell you, I began throwing kids and desk out of the way, and I finally cornered him in the back of the room. I grabbed him by the shirt collar neck and the seat of his jeans, and I got him over my shoulders, fully intent on throwing him through an open window on this side of the, of the classroom building. Well, of course, all the other children were loving it. They said, let him go, Mr. Roos, throw him. Let's see him go out. See, of course, I got to the, to the window and realized this is the living end. You know, I'm totally out of control. Uh, my anger has absolutely consumed my behavior, and it was absolutely the worst moment I could ever remember. I still didn't know what to do with Kenny. In exasperation, I took him to the back of the room and flung him bodily up on some lockers in the back of the classroom. These were lockers where the children hung their coats and kept their lunches and their books. And I said, now, Kenny, you sit there. Turned around, walked to the front of the room, and really, really just felt terrible. Turned around to my great surprise, utter delight, Kenny Ratsbottom had folded his arms and his legs and was sitting very quietly up on the lockers. And he sat there for the entire hour and he said not a word. And all the other children kept looking around, <laughs> wondering when he was going to do his thing, see. First time, see, in all their lives, Kenny had ever behaved in class. At 11 o'clock, he came back in. I greeted him at the door. I said, Kenny, how would you like to sit back up on the lockers? This said, yes, sir. I said, come on. Boy, I took him, put him right back up on the lockers. He was quiet through the 11 o'clock period, and I was teaching. Well, by noon, it was all over school that Kenny was behaving in my class, and the teachers came down to my, to my little office, and they said, what are you doing with Brother Ratsbottom? I said, well, what we're doing here. 